In this module, we will explore the concept of multidimensional child poverty. First, we will revise the key elements of both multidimensional poverty and multidimensional child poverty. Then we will compare the main existing methodologies to measure multidimensional child poverty. We will touch upon gender differences and how this type of poverty differs from monetary poverty. Finally, we will briefly discuss its policy design and implementation. Many of the concepts discussed in the first part of this module can also be found in the PEP Online Class 11, Multidimensional Poverty, in the course Measuring and Alleviating Poverty and Inequality. You can find the link in the description box. First, we will revise some theoretical background about multidimensional child poverty. It is well established that poverty is a wider and more complicated concept than just monetary poverty. Monetary poverty focuses on the resources and the means to access goods and services, and as we have seen, it is usually measured by income or consumption data. Deprivation and multidimensional poverty are about the realization and fulfillment of basic needs and rights, and are usually measured by the actual access to goods and services so not just the potential to access which is given by monetary metrics. This approach focuses more on the social and psychological aspects of well-being, usually measured by a subjective assessment. These three aspects of well-being are interrelated. In this module, we focus on the deprivation aspect. We have seen in the previous module how children experience poverty differently from adults. Multidimensional child poverty is different from adult poverty because indicators of child well-being and deprivation are different. Children are dependent on others and the environment they live in is especially important. As we have seen, children do not control income nor do they make decisions on allocation of resources. At the same time, we know that child poverty has long-lasting consequences, while policies can be short-sighted. Deprivation in health, nutrition, and education, for example, can have devastating consequences on a child's present and future life. Finally, as with monetary poverty, multidimensional poverty affects children much more than adults in disproportionate ways. One of the main approaches to child poverty is the human rights approach. It is based on the Conventions on the Rights of the Child, CRC, adopted by the UN General Assembly in 1989. A human rights approach concerns both the opportunities of children and what is called process freedom. This is the presence of an adequate legal and political framework that ensures the protection of those rights. With this approach, deprivation is defined as a violation of a child's rights. This is the approach taken by UNICEF in measuring child deprivation and multidimensional child poverty. It is a powerful approach for child poverty because most countries have signed and ratified the CRC. Another approach to multidimensional poverty is the basic needs approach. Basic needs are identified as fundamental for every individual for the full physical, mental, and social development of a person. The basic needs of children and adults differ as well as the basic needs of children of different ages. A very young child has some specific needs in terms of nutrition, care, and so on, which are not the same as those of an 8-year-old or a 14-year-old, for example. Although we can argue that the core basic needs are the same, for example, adequate nutrition, health, and education, they are accessed in different ways. Moreover, children depend on family and society to fulfill their needs. The capability approach, developed by Amartya Sen, is considered by many to be the foundation of measuring human development and multidimensional poverty. The capability approach is based on the idea that we all should have opportunity, ability, agency, and freedom to achieve states of being and doing what we value in life. Children need to realize their capabilities to reach their full potential as adults, and what matters for children's well-being is their ability to function and to be capable. In other words, how children are able to function with the goods and services at their disposal. With children, it is especially important to recognize the role of evolving capabilities. 
These capabilities, as basic needs, evolve as the child grows. And the importance of conversion factors. Conversion factors are defined as those individual and or structural factors that are relevant to the achievement of a capability. These are factors such as abilities or disabilities, gender, place of residence, and the legal framework prevalent in a given country. For example, a child may be free to ride a bicycle, but there are no adequate roads, or her movement may be restricted because she is a girl. We can consider the capability approach to be comprehensive of both the human rights and the basic needs approach. This figure, adapted from the bioecological framework proposed by Brenner in the 90s, shows how the child is at the center of different systems that interact both with the child and between themselves. Poverty and deprivation are the result of the interactions of all these systems. From the macro system, which includes economic and social policies, cultural background, and so on, to the microsystem of the family, which is concerned with the allocation of resources in the family. There are also the local systems of social norms, education, health, and infrastructures, etc. All of these determine the final outcomes that we observe. As an example, a child going to school is a function of their age, their gender, and if they have a disability. How this plays out depends on parents' and family income, family structure, how many school-aged children does the family have, what is the family's income, and parents' preferences. Maybe they prefer to send boys to school over girls, which in turn depends on available infrastructure. Are there schools in the community? Do children need to make a long commute to school? Prevalent social norms. Are disabled children allowed in school? Are there prejudices? And political and legal environments. Is it illegal for girls to go to school? The UN definition of child poverty is already multidimensional and it explicitly refers to deprivation in basic needs such as nutrition, water, health care, shelter, education, etc. Recently, the SDG 1.2 recognized the need to monitor poverty in all of its dimensions for children as well as for adults. A good example of why multidimensional child poverty is an important topic is the story of Harry Potter. Harry, at the start of the book series, lives with his aunt and uncle in a wealthy home of a wealthy family in a rich country. However, he himself is deprived. He does not have adequate clothes or enough food, even though there is plenty of it in the house. His rights are also violated. He is mistreated, made to sleep in a cupboard, and made to do many chores. He also does not have agency and is completely dependent on his family. All of this while his family, including his cousin, a child of the same age, lives comfortably. While Harry sleeps in the cupboard, his cousin has two bedrooms. The Harry Potter paradox highlights how children can be deprived in multiple aspects, even while living in a rich household. After covering the theoretical aspects, we will revise the main elements of measuring multidimensional child poverty. The first key elements of measuring multidimensional child poverty is dimensions. Dimensions define the domains or spheres in which we define deprivation. They reflect the theoretical background, so they usually reflect a right or a need or a capability. Dimensions need to be relevant internationally. So constructing an international measure an example could be sustainable development goals and or a local context. They should be measurable with one or more indicators and ideally rely on objective rather than subjective indicators. Here we see an example of how dimensions of deprivation in the first column can be linked to capabilities, to articles of the CRC, and to SDGs. For example, the dimension health is related to the capability to survive and to have access to basic health services. It is linked to Article 24 of the CRC and to the SDG number 3. This is useful to ground dimensions in a broader framework and also to operationalize them. Indicators are what makes a dimension in practice. 
For example, for the dimension of education, we can have school attendance as an indicator. Indicators are what is needed to be measured in practice. In a way, dimensions are the conceptual part and indicators the practical version of them. In the same way, we have SDGs that then are operationalized by specific targets. The general goal one is no poverty, and the targets and indicators dictate how the goal is defined. It is important to distinguish between indicators and correlates of deprivation. This is why it is important to have a good, solid framework. Indicators are the proxies of dimensions. They usually represent a right or a capability, while correlates are related to conversion factors. For example, we cannot say that a disability is a deprivation per se, but it can be a correlate of deprivation. It is also important to refer to the data used, including the reference population. If an indicator only refers to a specific subset of the population, such as treatment of illness, which is typically collected only for children who have been ill in the reference period, it should be used with caution, since we do not know what would have happened to all the children who were not ill at that moment. Thresholds are the demarcation line between deprivation and non-deprivation, in the same way that poverty lines separate the poor and the non-poor. Common measures of multidimensional poverty rely on binary indicators, and they usually employ two thresholds, one for the indicator that defines who is deprived, and one for the aggregate score, which defines who is multidimensionally poor and who is not. This method is called dual cutoff. Usually, thresholds for indicators are selected adhering to international standards, such as SDG targets or UN conventions, but they can also be defined by national or regional customs. Here we see an example of a threshold for an indicator of sanitation. The indicator is access to improved sanitation and the household is deprived if they use unimproved sanitation facilities. The definition of improved and unimproved refers to WHO standards and in particular to those defined first in the Millennium Development Goals and in the SDGs now. We see here, for example, that flush toilets are improved unless they flush to an imprecise location while a pit latrine without a slab to cover it is unimproved, as well as not having any sanitation. We can see here that this approach reduces variability in an indicator, transforming information into a binary variable. You either have improved good sanitation or unimproved bad sanitation. Once dimensions and indicators are defined, the key element of a multidimensional child poverty measure is the aggregation function. This defines how we construct the measure. Many indices of multidimensional poverty use what is called the counting approach. They just sum the indicators or dimensions to obtain a final score. This is the easiest and most intuitive way to aggregate. However, counting indices are not without problems and they are not necessarily the only solution. One crucial decision in developing a measure of multidimensional child poverty is whether to first aggregate indicators into dimensions and only then aggregate dimensions into a final score, or to aggregate indicators directly into the final score. This does not matter if dimensions are made of only one indicator. Aggregating indicators into dimensions first introduces an additional step. How do we aggregate indicators into dimensions? And an additional threshold, a new cutoff, how do we define deprivation in each dimension? Using this approach, we move from a dual to a triple cutoff. There are two main approaches to the aggregation of indicators into dimensions. The union approach, which considers an individual to be deprived in any dimension D if they are deprived in any of the indicators of that dimension. The second approach is the intersection approach, which considers an individual to be deprived in a given dimension only if she is deprived in all indicators. Then we can also adopt an international approach that uses an intermediate number of indicators, for example, 
two out of three total. The importance we give to each dimension and each indicator are the weights. Most weights used are arbitrary and reflect either a value judgment or some other consideration. It is possible to construct weights starting from the data itself using techniques such as principal component or factor analysis. However, the evidence suggests weights produced this way are not necessarily more reliable than normative ones. Most multidimensional child poverty measures use equal weights, assigning equal importance to each dimension. However, it is important to highlight that this implies a perfect substitution between dimensions. If I exchange a deprivation in a given dimension x with another y, the total score remains the same. This is not true if x has a bigger weight than y, or vice versa. Binary indicators and counting indices, while widely used for their simplicity and flexibility, have several shortcomings. They are very sensitive to the poverty line, producing jumps and discontinuities in the distribution. It is always better to show the whole distribution of deprivation and, if possible, perform sensitivity analysis on the distribution of deprivations to check if the order of individuals changes when altering something in the measure. Headcounts of multidimensional poverty do not follow strict monotonicity. If a poor individual becomes poorer, the headcount stays the same as for monetary poverty. It is also important to consider both the depth of deprivation, how much the deprived are deprived, and the joint distribution of deprivations. In other words, the overlaps and the correlation between dimensions are central to a multidimensional poverty measure. The construction of a multidimensional child poverty measure needs to consider available data, and therefore the choice of an adequate data set. Data for a multidimensional poverty measure needs to come from a single data set. The data we choose restricts the information we have at our disposal and therefore the dimensions and indicators included to construct a multidimensional poverty measure. For example, it would be useful to include nutritional deprivation of youth in a multidimensional child poverty measure, but most surveys only include this information for children under five years. There are several international micro-surveys that can be used, such as the Demographic and Health Survey, DHS, the Multiple Indicators Cluster Surveys, MICS, and the World Bank's Living Standards Measurement Survey, etc. It is important to consider the sampling design. For example, DHS is focused on the women's population, while MICS focuses on children, LSMS, are designed to capture household level indicators mostly. DHS and MICS do not have information on monetary poverty, but they have more information on issues related to children and health and women. The geographical disaggregation is also important to consider. How much is the survey representative of? In some cases, it may be possible to use small area level estimation techniques to do poverty mapping of multidimensional child poverty. We will now review the most common methodologies to measure multidimensional child poverty. The first thing to clarify is what and how we can measure this type of poverty. We can measure children in multidimensionally poor households, similarly to what we do with monetary poverty, or we can try to devise a targeted measure that takes children as a unit of analysis. Additionally, measures and indices can be constructed at the global, regional, or national level. There are four main approaches to measuring multidimensional child poverty. All of them are variations of a counting approach. Methodologies based on the child are the so-called Bristol methodology, which was the first method to measure child deprivation in low-income countries. It was used for UNICEF's State of the World Children 2005, and later for the global studies on child poverty and disparities. The Bristol approach uses two definitions of deprivation, severe and moderate. Then UNICEF developed the Multiple Overlapping Deprivation Analysis, MODA, M-O-D-A. It is an evolution of Bristol, and it has been conceived more as a flexible tool to adapt to different contexts, for example, Sub-Saharan Africa or the EU 
International Studies. Both methodologies conceptually center the child as a unit of analysis and use the Convention on the Rights of the Child as a framework to define dimensions of deprivation. The other main approach is the Multidimensional Poverty Index, MPI, which is a household-based measure. Therefore, we can use it to measure children in poor households. In its global version, it has been widely tested and used, and it is routinely reported by the UNDP in the Human Development Report. The MPI is based on the Alkir Foster method, which is a counting method based on a double cutoff and uses a system of nested weights, which we will see later. The MPI has also been adapted to children in some specific contexts such as Bhutan, Thailand, and others. Recently, World Bank has developed its own multidimensional poverty measure, which can also be used to measure children in multidimensionally poor households. The World Bank's measure is based on the same methodology as the MPI, but uses different dimensions, including income, which the other most common measures do not include. They cross-tabulate their multidimensional measure with monetary poverty income. In this table, we can see a comparison of the three main methodologies used to measure multidimensional child poverty. Here, they are reported in their cross-country comparative versions. As we can observe, many of the indicators and dimensions are very similar because they are all part of the same family of methodology, and partially because they rely on the same data sources. Bristol uses a counting approach with one indicator per dimension, and it uses a double cutoff to define deprivation. A child is considered deprived if they have at least two dimensions of deprivation. Bristol defines a severe and a moderate multidimensional poverty measure with different definitions for each dimension. In this table, we can see the indicators for each of the seven dimensions defined by the Bristol methodology shelter, sanitation, water, food, health, education, and information, both for the moderate and severe definition. MODA uses a counting approach and is firmly rooted in the Convention on the Rights of the Child with equal weightings of dimensions to construct the multidimensional poverty measure. This translates into a triple cutoff approach, deprivation in indicators, then deprivation in dimensions, then the multidimensional cutoff. MODA commonly uses the union approach to aggregate indicators into dimensions, which is illustrated in the table. MODA also puts an emphasis on overlaps and the full distribution of deprivation, and it provides the average intensity of deprivation. For example, the average number of deprivations experienced by the deprived, and the adjusted head count, which is defined as the head count times the intensity, similar to the MPI. The table in this slide presents the dimensions, seven as for Bristol, and indicators of MODA in its cross-country version. MODA also emphasizes a life cycle approach, recognizing the evolving needs and rights of children. Therefore, some of the dimensions are defined only for children under five, health and nutrition, or over five education and information. The MPI uses a counting approach with weights. It directly aggregates indicators into the final score, giving a weight to each indicator according to a system of nested weights, which means each dimension has equal weight, and each indicator within each dimension has equal weight. So if there are three dimensions, two dimensions have two indicators each, and the third has six. In this case, the first four indicators weigh one-third divided by two, which is equal to one-sixth each, while the remaining six indicators weigh one-third divided by six, which is equal to one-eighteenth each. The MPI uses a dual cutoff. The first defines deprivation in indicators, and the second defines multidimensional poverty. You don't need to know if an individual is deprived in a given dimension to calculate the index. The multidimensional cutoff is 0.33 of the weighted sum of indicators. Other cutoffs are used as sensitivity checks. Technically, the MPI is one number defined as the head count multiplied by the average score of those who are deprived. 
the resulting index respects the monotonicity because it worsens if a poor individual becomes poorer. Another example of this methodology is the Women Empowerment in Agriculture Index, WEAI. This table illustrates the dimensions, indicators, and weights of the MPI. Different choices have different implications and consequences, and we should be mindful of them both in calculating and using multidimensional poverty measures. As mentioned, using equal weights means that each dimension is a perfect substitute of another. You can trade health and education, for example. In the MPI, within each dimension, each indicator is a substitute of the other. You can trade water with sanitation or child mortality with malnutrition. Because of the number of indicators in the system of weights, combined with the threshold for poverty, a person can have no access to water, no toilet, and be malnourished, and still not be considered MD poor, with the threshold of 0 0.33. The number of indicators within a dimension should be carefully considered, in MODA as well, because with the union approach that has more indicators in any given dimension, the probability to be deprived in that dimension increases. It is good practice to have a balance between dimensions and the number of indicators. Additionally, the use of the union approach and the triple cutoff implies a violation of strict monotonicity. If a child was already deprived in one of the two indicators and becomes deprived in the other as well, the final deprivation score does not change. As we have seen, there are crucial choices that influence the outcomes of a multidimensional poverty measure. These are 1. The number of indicators for each dimension, 2. The weights, 3. The number of dimensions, and 4. The cutoff points to define multidimensional poverty analysis. Because of these factors, it is always important to run a sensitivity and robustness analysis. Can we trick a multidimensional poverty measure? Because many of the choices are arbitrary, yes. We need one, a good guiding principle, two, to be sure of what we actually want to measure, see first part, and finally three, disclosure and transparency about choices and their implications and limits. Here we see some examples of measurements of multidimensional child poverty. In this slide, you can see the rates of multidimensional child poverty, defined as a child who experiences two or more deprivations in 11 Arab states. In this application of MODA, there are two different definitions of multidimensional child poverty, one severe and one moderate, similar to the Bristol methodology. In this graph, you can see the distribution of the head count and intensity of multidimensional child poverty in 30 African countries. The estimates have been done using cross-country MODA. It is important to always look at the intensity of multidimensional child poverty because the headcount, as mentioned, does not provide a full picture. For example, in a country where infrastructure is lacking, you can find that most children are deprived in one or two particular dimensions, such as water and sanitation, but not in other dimensions. This may result in a high head count, but in a low intensity of deprivation. From a policy perspective, it is crucial to have this type of information to plan and design interventions. Here are some principles to develop a national measure of multidimensional child poverty. It is important to define what goes into the index before the methodology. The measure should be rooted in a clear theoretical approach, capabilities, basic needs, human rights, etc. This is important because all decisions are ultimately arbitrary. It should acknowledge different needs of people of different groups and ages, having indicators and dimensions that are age-specific. It should reveal the profile of the most disadvantaged to guide programming and shed light on inequality. Finally, it should make sense for a country's priorities, monitoring SDG 1.2 and informing policies. We want a measure that is responsive to a policy, although that should not be the defining feature. It is important that the measure is replicable to ensure careful monitoring. In this part, we will look at gender and other inequalities in multidimensional child poverty. 
Gender differences in head counts of multidimensional child poverty are often small or not visible. This does not mean they are not there, but rather that multidimensional child poverty is not the best suited way to capture them since data is not sufficiently nuanced because composite measures hide specific differences and the indicators used may not reflect gender differences. For example, household level indicators such as access to water will not show gender difference unless for some reason there are some boys or girls in a water-deprived household. However, in that case, it would not be a gender difference in deprivation, but rather reflect a wider issue. It would be different if we could measure, for example, how much time each individual child spends to collect water. Additionally, gender differences tend to appear with age, so they are averaged out by broad age groups or household measures. In some cases, they may not be what we expect. For example, boys tend to be more deprived in education than girls, because boys are the ones entering the labor market when the family needs this. In this example, which comes from the cross-sectional study of multidimensional child poverty in sub-Saharan Africa, we see that gender differences are small. Boys are more deprived in wasting, example weight for height, and in primary completion, while girls are more likely deprived in primary school attendance. However, these differences do not get reflected in the overall head count. Using longitudinal data, we can observe how gender differences in deprivation evolve. Here we have children in the Tanzania Panel Survey in 2008-9 and four years later in 2012-13. We observe that while boys were and remain more deprived in education, they become more deprived in protection, mostly because they do more child labor. Here, protection is defined as child labor and child marriage. Boys also become more deprived than girls in nutrition, measured by a low BMI for age. One important takeaway is that gender differences are more likely to be visible in some specific domains of deprivation that may not be usually included in a multidimensional child poverty measure, as the general recommendation is to keep non-material deprivation apart from the multidimensional measure. In this case, it was the national decision to include them. Here we can see what indicators are driving the differences. Boys are more likely to be behind in school, to engage in child labor, to have low BMI, to not have completed primary, while girls are more likely to be married. As we can see, gender differences in deprivation are transmitted through some specific indicators, which also reflect gender norms, such as boys leaving school to work. Here we can see some of the correlates of the different indicators using both Tanzania and Malawi as examples. Both countries have a similar panel survey conducted in similar years. The indicators for gender differences are also similar. In both countries, what drives the differences are participation in labor, grade for age and school, and while in Tanzania we have nutritional information, in Malawi, part of the gender differences are found in school attendance as well. Protective and risk factors are similar. Education of the head of the household has similarly protective effects, reducing the likelihood of deprivation. But while living in a rural area increases the likelihood of deprivation in both countries. Interestingly, however, it decreases the likelihood of labor for boys in Malawi, which is due to the different structures of their economic systems. This illustrates the complexity of gender differences in deprivation and multidimensional child poverty. Gender differences are not the only type of differences observed in multidimensional child poverty. Differences by area, rural versus urban, education of the head of household, wealth, all play a role. In the case of the cross-national study of the Arab states, the biggest differences are the ones between rural and urban areas and the wealth of the household. In this final part, we will look at the interaction between monetary and multidimensional child poverty and how multidimensional child poverty can be integrated in anti-poverty programming and policies. Multidimensional and monetary child poverty are two sides of the same coin. Children are more likely to be poor than adults according to both metrics, 
both at national and global levels. Multidimensional child poverty tends to be stickier. Because it depends on structural investment, it can be harder to change. Household correlates, such as education of the household head, rural versus urban residents, single-headed household, for both multidimensional and monetary child poverty are similar. Monetary poverty influences the likelihood of a child to be multidimensionally poor, but the relationship is not necessarily linear. It depends on the context and the level of deprivation. The implication is that policies that mostly address households' lack of money alone, such as cash transfers, may not be able to reduce multidimensional child poverty effectively. At the global level, children are more likely to be poor with both multidimensional and monetary poverty. In this example from Mali, we see that monetary poverty and multidimensional poverty do not perfectly overlap, and 14% of children are deprived in three or more dimensions but are not living in monetary poverty. Even looking at the map on the right, we see that geographical distribution of monetary poverty top map, and multidimensional child poverty, lower map, are different. In Mozambique, provinces with quite different rates of monetary poverty have similarly high levels of multidimensional child poverty. Correlating the number of deprivations with the consumption aggregate, we see how the relationship is not linear. Here the graph shows the relationship by area of residence of the consumption of the household with the number of deprivations experienced by children in Armenia. We can see that the relationship is stronger, i.e. the curve is steeper, at low levels of consumption below the poverty line, the red vertical line, but then it becomes flatter as consumption increases. This means that monetary transfers can only do so much in reducing multidimensional child poverty. Integrating analysis of MD and monetary poverty can be very powerful for policy programming. We need both measures to have a full picture and inform policies. Having both tools, we can provide a better understanding of policies and scenarios. Additionally, as we have seen in the previous module, in many low-income countries, monetary poverty lines are very low. Multidimensional child poverty can offer a better understanding of the real situation of children. For example, in Tanzania, 19% of children live below the national poverty line, while 88% of children are deprived in three or more dimensions. In this example, we see different possible policies addressing multidimensional child poverty. The only monetary intervention that would work would be a transfer to close the poverty gap entirely, which is not feasible. Other interventions are needed to address multidimensional child poverty. Multidimensional child poverty can provide a supplementary targeting tool for policies. How are social policies doing in targeting deprived children? We can also include multidimensional child poverty in evaluation designs of social protection and security programs, such as the evaluation of cash transfers or other interventions. Multidimensional child poverty can also be linked to fiscal analysis and public finance for children to answer questions such as how are tax burdens borne across households with multidimensionally poor children? To what extent does public spending on children redress inequalities of consumption, incomes, and wealth? And what are the expected effects of changing the composition and scale of public spending or a proposed fiscal reform of child poverty? To sum up, multidimensional child poverty is a powerful tool for understanding the situation of children. It is relevant because children experience different needs than adults and because income and monetary poverty are not always good predictors of multidimensional child poverty. The most powerful use of multidimensional poverty measures is its policy advocacy power. Multidimensional child poverty measures have consistently played a critical role in changing the understanding of poverty beyond income. It can provide a useful tool for policies and programming because its measures point to the need for increased multi-sectoral coordination 
and the rich profiling of multidimensional child poverty measures, example depth, severity, and overlaps, exposes disparities and can broadly inform and influence policies and programs and change the poverty narrative.